Hello, everybody from around the world. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here in Detroit. And I am here with the Reverend David William Perry out of London in merry old England. And we're here in our quest for truth, which obviously has become kind of a an unending Fibonacci series of sorts. And, uh, but this is episode 57 and we haven't uh, quite got there yet. And that's okay because it's the riddles that lead us ever forward. And so in, in light of this, I like to riddle myself as to what I might find to talk about. And Surprising to me, uh, I ended up uh, coming up with some some interesting byways because we tend to be more, uh, shall we say, uh, literary and and artistic, so to speak. But uh, so we like to find ways of of uh, exploring the dynamics in which one can can center oneself and finding a path through all of this. And uh, as usual, I got my notes strewn all over the place. But uh, so let's just uh, start off today with, with a statement by Rudolf Steiner from, in Cologne from December 18th, 1913. That's in his Collected Works, volume 148 the fifth gospel. And he says, basically in the universe, there is nothing but consciousness, except for consciousness. Everything else belongs in the domain of Maya or the great illusion. And so here we are. Hi, David. Uh, good afternoon to you, John. Uh, a, a pleasure to be Fibonacciing with you again. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we were talking briefly about crown colonies before we began. I confess I've never noticed any freedom beyond that, but remember I'm a British subject, not a citizen. Um, they try and smuggle the words uh, citizen in now and again, but it doesn't wash. You know, I mean, <laughs> without a codified constitution, you can't really say, that's why you're treating me badly. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, an another week in, in post-lockdown post Britain where already everybody's always uh, already talking about the next lockdown. Um, I hope it's not happening. It's destroying our Nephilim Anthropology Conference because lots of people want to book and are afraid to book the tickets. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's one of those, one of those weeks in the, the sort of... <sighs> In, in the sort of a frustrated minister where you just wish people would see some bloody sense and get a grip. But I'm afraid in, in post-lockdown Britain, that's exactly what they don't want to do. I'll tell you something that's been on my mind all, all week. Um, the, les Enfants Terribles, uh, Les Enfants Terribles, Alistair Crowley, I mean, he was the one that said this was the age of the crowned and conquering child. Of course, he meant Horus. Um, oh, my God. I mean, how can he have been so right? He must have been in the service of dark powers. But nobody wants to grow up here. Nobody wants to be an adult. They all want to be some sort of half assed teenager forever, you know, running around, getting zonked up on alcohol and being completely irresponsible, which is why we're on the verge, maybe, of a third lockdown and nobody's bothered. That's how I am this week. I wonder how things are over in magical and adult Detroit. Well, yeah, it's. Uh, I ran into uh, a woman, an elderly woman, the other day, and made comment about the current affairs, and and she basically said. Uh, she'd rather not think about it. And so I think that uh, 
that's part of the reason that we're in the situation we're in is the people that would rather not think about it. And uh, of course, they've entrusted their future to other people. And anytime there's any kind of concentration of, of power, uh, it corrupts. I mean, that's just uh, kind of a universal that was uh, aptly uh, framed by Lord Acton, the wonderful rare bird as far as it goes in, in the UK or in England actually at that time, uh, that he was uh, a member, he was a Lord, but he was Catholic. And uh, so that's kind of a, an unusual thing, unless you understand some of the deeper machinations uh, then it begins to make sense. But he said, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, great men are almost always bad men. So there you have it. If you give uh, a great deal of power to an ordinary human, they're probably going to be so weighted down that they won't be able to resist whatever is dangled in front of them. And uh, that quotation has, has really got an increased use over the last few years. And part of that, to a large measure, is uh, kind of summed up in, in something that Rudolf Steiner said in the lecture series that's published as The Karma of Untruthfulness. And this was back in 1917, so we know it's WW1, World War I, is, is embroiling. And he says, that's why I said the other day, in future, all the efforts that have been made towards peace will be forgotten. And in the periphery, the only thing to be remembered will be the shouting down of peace but it will not be remembered as a shouting down, but as something that was justified. Everything else will be forgotten. This is sure to be what will happen. So at least our discussions here should be a contribution to making it possible to sense the truth of the situation. For today, one of the foremost demands made of those who are truly concerned with the welfare of mankind and the progress of mankind is that they should not allow themselves to be taken in by untruthfulness. Uh, thanks to Evan Folds for reminding me of that. And uh, there you have it. I find it increasingly difficult to argue with Rudolf Steiner's prognostications of human history. Are you there? Okay. Well. Yeah, I didn't realize that was my cue. I do apologize. Um, <laughs> oh, my God, I missed a cue line. I never did missed I, a cue did, line. Did I ring your bell? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. No, you've got me reeling as a British subject, you see. Um, <laughs> oh, John, gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, the Twin Towers thing came up a couple of days ago which had me lost in meditation. Of course, it was such a global disaster. I mean, really, sometimes the word global really is appropriate. And so many people from so many different ethnic groups and, and cultures lost their lives in this genuinely American tragedy. I mean, that, that's been on my mind a lot. And, you know, I, I suppose, you're, you know, the quote you just read out triggered that, including there's a meme going around in Britain at the minute with George Orwell looking smug, saying, did I call it or what? Um, which, yeah, I mean, my trouble with most of the conspiracy theorists, um, I'm not naming names. I mean, David Icke will probably know who I mean, but I'm not naming names. You know, is, is no, he actually didn't approve of, of the material in 1984. Of course, it was originally going to be called 1948, and his publisher decided for very just reasons to jump on that. No, you're not putting it then. 
So that's why it became 1984. Um, look, this most sinister of all books where people, you know, I mean, it's the ruthless real politic of it all that caught me on the first reading. I was looking at some extracts of it again the other day. It loses none of its malevolence, uh, no matter how many times you read it. The bit that caught me the other day was maybe an extract that hadn't overwhelmed me before when it should have done, which is, of course, when uh, O'Brien is talking to Winston. O'Brien is one of the ultimate party leaders, um, you know, one of the heads, if not the head of the Thought Police himself, is saying to Winston as a, a normal party member, uh, I'm paraphrasing, look, you know, you, you could be replaced whenever we want you to. All we need to do is take a bright pleb uh, from his from his background and make him into someone like you. You can just be erased and someone else can replace you. And it was, wasn't was till the other day I suddenly realised that, yes, uh, they did realise there were bright plebs, plebeians, ordinary people, but a, a, ability didn't matter. Nothing counted apart from one's allegiances to the party, which seemed to have actually been hereditary. Um, and that I don't know, is that happening here in, in this sort of non-free British Isles? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's worrying me to death at the minute. The fact nobody's questioning over here what's going on, apart from uh, one or two members of the lunatic fringe and one or two people uh, and genuinely lunatic fringe, you know, I mean, do, you know, are, are intergalactic lizards behind it all? I don't know. But, you know, they're certainly not making public broadcasts. You know, let's calm down. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and one or two making, one or two people making very sinister political comments and then not following it up. So we're all just, I don't know. I don't know what the actual mentation is over here. It, it's sort of, you know, it's almost on the, on the level of Cella V, you know, that's what it is. And you think, oh my God, personally, I find myself sinking into a, a negative depression about it all. I, I actually don't think it's aimed at our generation. You know, this global takeover bid on the part of the corporations, which is clearly what it is, um, because I think they know they'll get too much aggro, that fine British word um, from us. Uh, what they're aiming at, I think, is the generation down the line a bit, not even possibly the millennials. The millennials, um, with love and respect, because some of them are towering, beautiful people. And not ironic, not sarcastic. Some of them genuinely are. My view, my my criticism, if I had one, was they're a bit too optimistic, a bit too idealistic. The world doesn't change for the better that quickly, if only it would, but it doesn't. Um, at least in any generation I can read about or study to date, that hasn't happened. Um, it's the generation under them um, that seem to know nothing apart from, I don't know, these computer games and alternative realities and a life of fantasy, which is basically disguised as alternate reality. Another phrase going around here at the minute. What is an alternate reality? I rather like reality. You know what? What? What are you trying to uh, say by that? You know, are you saying that you you lead some sort of life elsewhere, and in what way? Well, only as long as the electricity lasts, and only as long as the police aren't battering down the door because they're fed up with you. Um, you know, we've got to be very careful of witnessing fantasy life as the life of imagination, of art, of creativity, which sometimes it is, but most of the time it is not. Because, of course, imagination is another eye in the human spirit, which is equal but uh, pa and parallel to reason. Fantasy is not. Fantasy tends to be the doggerel of the imagination. And we need it as human beings for, for all sorts of reasons. You know, Freud is actually fascinating about these things. You know, the libido is constantly renewing and unsettling itself with all of these saucy scenarios. But actually what's going on behind all of that is something very, very serious. Uh, the species constantly pushing itself to renew. I mean, wonderful, intriguing thoughts, but none of that is imagination. It's not Leonardo da Vinci. It's not, you know, it's not any of those things grasping reality in a different way. So the fact people are refusing 
to grapple with these issues, to grapple with these problems is something I'm finding increasingly worrying. You can almost hear the tongues licking and moistened lips in various quarters of heraldic Britain. You know, the, the hereditary castes find it, seeming to feel they can finally make a comeback. You know, in, it, with serfdom, what was that book, John? The Road to Serfdom? I can't remember it offhand. Remember it years back because they seem to be winning with gusto. And all, all you've got to do, you don't have to enslave anybody financially. You just get them leading a fantasy life and not questioning. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. There's a bit of a wandering tirade. I'll hand back to you. Well, yes, the... Uh... You could look at that as the restructuring of, of the entail. <laughs> and for those that, that are outside of uh, Great Great Britain, as they call it, uh, the entail is, is your inherited uh, claim uh, that is bequeathed to you by the crown. And it's your, your handed a custodial relationship with uh, one arena of activity. And it's interesting because you don't have a choice, by the way. If you happen to be born uh, the eldest son of a duke and your father passes away, you're the duke, whether you want to be the duke or not. And you know, really, the only way to get out of it is by uh, committing a felony or dying. <laughs> so it's it's really an unusual system inherited from uh, the Norman impulse that streamed into uh, Anglo-Saxon England. And so you have the kind of the obermensch, the, the overlords of the system primarily are the, the, uh, the Norman conquerors as still to this day the vast majority of the peerage is composed of, of descendants of the Norman conquerors that came in with William the Conqueror. And uh, although there are a few uh, Saxon houses that are represented in the peerage. So why do I say that? I, well, because so, so much of what is going on is, is uh, smacks of neo-feudalism, yes. And uh, but if you look at it, you go, well, the entail, what does that what does that entail? Well, th these days it has to do with offshore trusts and, and uh, uh, corporate holdings and, and uh, foundations and and that whole arena of, of activity that is basically proprietary. I mean, just to look at the, the queen's portfolio. Oh, you can't do that. It's against the law to look at the queen's portfolio, right? I mean, what's up with that? <laughs> Talk about an heirloom. It's an air web. It's a, it's like this spider web of corporate activity, uh, which goes on in her name. Uh, you know, she tries to stay abreast of it. She has those little red boxes brought to her palace in the middle of the night, full of all the committees, secret committees, by the way. Uh, nobody knows who's on those committees except for the queen, not even the prime minister. So I don't know if that qualifies <laughs> as representative government, but it seems kind of unusual to me. And then up above that's the cast of characters of the Privy Council. and that whole group of several hundred are the insiders as far as uh, your domain is concerned, uh, Reverend David. So just to clear the air on that, the, the entail has been transformed from, from agrarian use to uh, corporate structuring. And uh, corporations filed through CTI Corporation in Amsterdam for the most part. So Amsterdam's involved, and we have, we have a, somebody from here, Paula, she's from Amsterdam. And so we're all, we're all in on this thing. And so why are we doing this if, if we're, we're 
exuding this this aura of uh, neo feudalism here? Well, it's because uh, two thousand years ago, an event happened. Rudolf Steiner describes this the mystery of Golgotha. And at that event, uh, Jesus Christ won. And so the rest of us are playing catch up at this point. And it's, it's a process of riddles. Although there's an aspect of this that, that will not be accomplished until the seventh stage of, of our journey. And those of you that have been following for a while know what I'm referring to. But I like to throw some riddles out once in a while. But in getting into what can we can do as far as to try and provide uh, a response to this scenario, we we have to be able to hold fast to our humanness. That's 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 what we have. And Humanness is, is centered upon the concept of individuality. But when you get into saying individuality, what does that mean? Because when you get into that, the basis of your individuality is what's called the true ego, which is the, the principle of the logos that's manifest in you that led St. Paul to say Christ in you so that you are a participant of the miracle of the logo, although your vehicles, your physical, etheric, and astral vehicles have yet to undergo the transformation that is presaged by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to be able to work our egos into our astral body brings about spirit self, working it into our etheric body brings about life spirit and working it into the physical brings about the spirit man or Atman. Buddhi Manas in the theosophical terminology that I imagine David is, Reverend David is more familiar with. But that being said, so then what do we do to get closer to that? Can you tell me? Get to church, the lot of you. Get to church, the lot of you. Um, oh, gosh. Um, I confess I'm with my partner in, in a hotel. Our, our regular listeners, our regular viewers will know I do that every now and again, not only because I need the rest and I'm usually caught between events, but also why not make something of it? It's a humble little little stay in hotel between, and I'm human. I need to rest every now and again between events. So I, I'm, I'm sort of balancing with microphones and 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 sort of where i should sit and everything keeps moving and i don't know why it's moving because the camera in front of me is perfectly still so I, my apologies to everyone that is my reality today um oh god um yeah i'm more comfy with theosophical terms at the moment um for the simple reason that i i did actually read fatty blavatsky um at some depth, I still find her an extraordinary woman. You know, and you know, what's this modern thing? If you read somebody, you must agree with every single word they said. No, I didn't. But you know, a remarkable lady in all sorts of ways. And extraordinary books. Um, yeah, the terminology I think is quite seductive. And even she really is trying to stretch beyond herself in a number of ways. I mean, I've an article coming out in one of the theosophical magazines actually quest magazine that's the american one my god is it december january i can't remember um where i followed up on a talk i gave to them recently about the persona of blavatsky which i think is actually strangely lost and yes is that important as you said yourself what makes us human actually is supremely important where of course she wasn't just the weird mad woman that lived down the road that was talking to spirits. Um, she was actually from an aristocratic background, was used to servants bloody doing as they were told uh, and, and traveling about since, since her, her, you know, being a young girl um, and going to exotic places. I mean, I know one of, I think they've left that in my, my article. I hear some, somebody went through it removing stuff. I'm waiting to get my copy. Um, you know, 
because uh, you know anyone that's travelled in Central Asia, anyone that's travelled in that part of the world, you know, she said something which I thought was amusing, and basically her critics, who are desperate to jump on it, give the woman a rest. Why are you people so desperate to jump on it? That in itself needs study. You know, I mean, I remember being in, in Bishkek once where, you know, oh, my God, it's the Rev. He's a foreigner from a long way off. Let's everybody in the bloody city and their grandparents go and meet him. You know, so you get to, you know, you get to a person of 15 and they're not even speaking Kyrgyzian. They're speaking something else. And there's a name that's 10 times more impronounceable than the one you were talking to two people ago. You know, and they're saying something, you know, I'm from Blah. And you think that sounds like about five different places I've heard of. And you just smile and shake hands because what else can you do? You know, I mean, so I think they're far too hard on her. Because I, as a fellow traveller in those parts of the world, I bloody know what it's like. You know, 30 people down the list, unless you're sat there writing it all down or you've got a stenographer, you get blasted away by the whole experience. They all want you to eat with them. You know, I got kidnapped by a famous filmmaker in Bishkek. We were sat at this sort of posh do, and Raman, I won't say the name Raman, you may see this, so I'm not saying it, was nudging me in the ribs with me thinking, oh, my God, this is a man that won a hero of the people medal under the Soviet term. He's not at the bottom. He's at the top. You know, he, their version of Hollywood elbowing me in the ribs and tugging at my, at my jacket. What on earth is he doing? And then I suddenly get whisked away in his mini, in his mini round to his house because he must entertain me as the guest. Not moaning. It was wonderful. It was wonderful meeting your wife. It was wonderful meeting your family. And then I get thrown back into the main meal and somebody else is trying to do it. You think, oh, my God, no. So I'm very simple. And now there's something up with this link, but I hope everything's still working. Um, I will keep going regardless. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of persona, I mean, I'm something of a personalist, um, which means I like the questions existentialists ask, but as I think I've intimated on this show previously, I don't like the solutions. I find the solutions nearly invariably shallow and not at the same level of power as their analysis of the questions. <clears throat> Wonderful analysis, really crap answer, Jean-Paul. You know, uh, to name but to, to name but one. <clears throat> I mean, God, how can a man of that intelligence, you know, values? Where do we get values from, Jean Paul? Oh, they arise like somebody wandering through a field, like partridges and game birds. They just naturally arise. No, they bloody don't. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, so the whole of moral discourse reduced to a stroll in the countryside and maybe one or two birds rushing out the bushes to tell us we're all going wrong. No, 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 no. Which leads me, so I like personalism, uh, that which makes us human, that which reminds us of our defining feature, um, which is why I like remembering the Queen as a person <clears throat> and the fact she lets it be known to us mere subjects that she doesn't like her personal holdings and she doesn't like her wealth being discussed. In fact, we're all told that from time to time. And the cur-like newspapers on all fours go along with it because they wouldn't dare, you know, because they all want a knighthood. They all want a knighthood at the end of it. Um, I don't want a knighthood. I, I'm, I'm a proud pleb. Um, I've survived as a non-Marxist. I don't know how, but I'm a proud, if you're in this part of the world, it's really difficult. Um, but a proud pleb dealing with pleb stuff. Um, what her holding in Rio Tinto, the major uh, uh, mining corp, that needs looking at because there's some skullduggery going on there which has caught everybody's attention and was quashed the minute it came into pu the public domain. Um, don't forget, in this part of the world, you're going to have things called denotices. If the establishment really doesn't like what you're saying, a denotice is served and you will go missing. Um, no joke, you'll be arrested and all your work will be confiscated. They can still be issued. They've never been repealed and they're still actively used. 
So there's all that going on. Um, and the royal interest in transhumanism. I find that interesting. What's my trouble with transhumanism? No, I'm not a Luddite. Um, I love tech. I, you know, the bits I understand of it. Like modern science, I think modern science is extraordinary. Huge advances in the human spirit. But tech is not humanity. And it just strikes me as some people who aren't talking science fiction, they're not talking about personal fantasy. Uh, like uh, Singularity University, I believe, in the States, uh, which are always very, very respectful to me. I'm on their mailing list. They strike me that they're blindly following a type of ideology that needs to be examined and explained. Um, point singularity, where the human being has melded as an organism with technology. I mean, someone needs to tell me, point one, why that's desirable. And point two, where does that get us? You know, so, okay, let's say that's even achievable. And I don't know whether ultimately it's achievable. It looks to me, it sounds to me like science fiction with a budget. Um, but if it is achievable, why? And nobody's questioning those things. And the royals have interest in such a thing. That's interesting in itself. And people are now, you know, they're now saying, well, I noticed a friend of mine, Jim Wilhelmson, thinks that's the body of the Antichrist, you know energy is being drawn into this counter counterfeit body trying to assert itself towards the end of time. I don't know if this is the end of time or not. I'm only a pastor. I'm only a minister. I don't know. But I mean, all the signs are there. I promise I'll stop this tirade in a minute, John. But I have noticed that transhumanism, where of course we give up our human identity and actually configure into something else, I find sinister. And why are so many people attracted to that technological solution to our problems without really close examination. So, uh, yeah, vive the human for all of its faults and weaknesses. Why can't we become fully human before we discuss becoming something more? Handing back to you, John. Yeah, I guess that's the uh, ultimate basic answer that, that would appeal to an ordinary individual is like, well, I mean, okay, why would we want that? I mean, if we look at the history of technology, you'll see that the vast majority of things that are invented is because the inventor found it interesting. And just because an inventor finds something interesting doesn't mean it's a good idea. <laughs> you know? And so you're, you're, again, handing off a tremendous amount of responsibility to a very small group of people uh, like Ray Kurzweil and other characters like that who seem to think that there's validity in this whole idea of the singularity because they are still transfixed by the notion that thoughts are something that's kind of extruded by your brain on some mysterious level and they have no concept of the super sensible or as far as i can tell uh, of the few that do but they have like a, an agenda that they're serving that's not what i would consider christ-like and so you have this kind of opposition in in that the whole uh, focus that, that Rudolf Steiner puts in his talks to the Christian community priests is that the, the Antichrist is essentially uh, that which is, is attempting to usurp the Christ. That's a, hence Antichrist, right? And well, what, what does that mean? Well, if there's still not just a straight up materialist, but they're still uh, religious, then you'd say that they are within the concept of the father, but that they, they don't accept uh, the super sensible reality of the mystery of Golgotha, that, that Christ uh, performed uh, this miraculous event on behalf of mankind 
at Golgotha a couple thousand years ago. Uh, and so that becomes the crux of, of, the, of the message that's in the Apocalypse of St. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But people, they frequently make reference to the Apocalypse. But they seem to leave out the parts to where uh, the good guys win, ultimately. And, and that that's, that's the culmination of it. So that we mustn't forget that the good guys win. Uh, yeah, where are the druids when you need them? Where are the druids when you need them? There's this show in Britain called Britannia. Um, I, I suppose it only has a magical effect here. You know, it's a lovely old costume drama. You know, remember the other cap I wear troops, you know, as frustrated theatrical, <laughs> frustrated theatrical impresario, stroke actor, stroke director, stroke oh, my God, we need a bigger budget. What are we going to do now, operative? Um, I've let it be known in circles esoteric that I'd love to be one of the druids in this show. I mean, they paint themselves bloody green. That's not, that's not even woad. The woads, which are described very clearly by the Romans, were blue. The whole point was they went blue, not green, but hey, that doesn't matter. And they've all got dilated eyes because they're heavily on psychedelics. Yeah, there might be some truth to that. But, you know, you Brahmin, the survival of Brahminist priesthood that's finally reached Northern Europe, lawgivers, magicians, priests, and upholders of the public good, where bloody are they when you need them? I'm sorry, I call that a dereliction of responsibility. They're meant to be turning up in droves at the minute. Um, truly, I mean, I'm not the flavour of the month at the Pagan Federation. Yes, I have interest in paganism. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm prancing around like a young thorn in the altogether in various British forests. Personally, I, I've not got the figure for it nowadays. My tummy tends to be on the large side as an ageing cleric. My knees wouldn't put up with it. My ankles wouldn't hold the dancing. I'm sorry, you know. So it can't be me that does it. I've got an interest in earth religions, eco-spirituality, but that doesn't mean that that somehow subordinates what I'm meant to be doing. If anything, it, uh, it's meant to sort of strengthen that. Uh, anyway, the Druids in this series are sort of the main foil of these Roman swines. Uh, and of course, if you look, if you look, I mean, it's a bit sort of Python-esque, Monty Python-esque, you know, uh, where, where you get in the life of Brian. Personally, I found the life of Brian absolutely hilarious. I remember when it first came out. Is anybody watching the movie apart from me? There are two distinct scenes where Jesus Christ is there. It's very clearly him. You know, I mean, like the gag about the three wise men, because they're only human, they get the wrong address when they're trying to <laughs> deliver their gifts. And they end up in Brian's gaff with his mother saying, well, who are you? you know, we're the three wise men. What are you doing here? We're looking for the saviour. Well, you know, what's that you're holding? Gold. Oh, he must be here then. You know, <laughs> and eventually one of their servants cottoning on, they've got the wrong house. And then pushing her physically out the way where they go to a classic scene of the Saviour. There's an angel over, over the over the sty, the, the Blessed Virgin. There's St. Joseph. You see the whole shooting match. And my other favourite bit from that movie is the Sermon on the Mount. You see him, the classic Jesus Christ, speaking in this beautiful way to as the assembled crowds. And, of course, I think I might have done the gag on this show before. I can't remember. The, the interest in Monty Python was the people right at the back who really could not have been able to hear what he's saying. You know, and, and a row breaking out because it's like any other group of human beings. And somebody saying to somebody else, what did he say? And somebody, you know, the recipient saying, he's talking about the cheesemakers, right, instead of peacemakers. You know, China, the Chinese whispers thing, and then somebody else taking umbrage and saying, Well, what's so special about the cheesemakers then? So you get very, very human scenarios. 
I mean, a lot of people were upset about that movie. Um, I know the Python people, they're, they're irreverent. What's wrong with a bit of irreverent humour? Um, they found the whole thing hilarious. Um, I actually heard, oh, gosh, which one was it? The one that does all the travelling. Um, I actually heard him give a, a, a talk at St Peter's Church in Piccadilly. Oh, who was that? Somebody, some one of the listeners, remind me of the name. He reinvented himself as an international traveller and darling of the BBC. Um, major, major Python completely slipped my mind at the minute, the name. I can see him now. And uh, he was talking about the life of Brian, and he said, look, there are some people who've done this series, you know, looking for the super sensible, paraphrasing. And you know, some of the things that have been sort of mind-blowing. But he couldn't understand what the backlash was um, because there were clear scenes of Jesus and what they were doing was attacking organized religion, which to me sounded very, very like the Pythons. Um, they spent most of their career attacking the British establishment and attacking what they thought were vested interests. Um, his name will come to me. His name will come to me. Um, but, yeah, so that's all of that's going on there. And I think we need, I don't know, we need, need a little more irreverence at the moment as opposed to more reverence, because it's getting us back into that feudal mode. Um, yes, my lord, no, my lord. You know, everything was harmonious in feudal times. People tend to forget that, because if you didn't do as you were told, you were either had your hands cut off or your family was beaten to a pulp. You know, there, there were real reasons. Ordinary people belonged to the land, and the land belonged to the lady of the house, which is why the, the knights fought each other for their lands, uh, which belonged to the lady, of course, who would come with you and your family lock, stock and barrel because there was no freedom. You belonged to her and her lands. Um, is that really what we want in the corporate bright future? I don't think so. Yeah, is the be all and end all another glass of champagne at the shareholders meeting, all of which have titles and all of which have long lineages leading themselves back into these grotesque and ancient scenarios personally i don't think so why can't we all come of age and embrace democracy take it seriously treat each other with a bit of respect and remember there are higher values above us all my trouble with uh, i think ai if ever there was something artificial it's the arguments for ai i'm sorry um all i really and i've read some of them right so sci-fi looking for a budget um you know, until I can have a, a row with a droid in Sainsbury's or Walmart, I don't believe in it. Some of the arguments are reasonably clever. Like, OK, OK, non-IA guy, what are you doing that's different? Which is a clever argument. But the answer is everything. I am doing everything differently. Do thoughts uh, come before consciousness? No. Thoughts arise out of consciousness, not the other way around. Therefore, find thoughts extruding from the brain. You will not even have begun to answer what the mystery of human consciousness actually is. And it gets more and more and more complex, not more simple. So for me, all of these wonderful, and I'm not disparaging it, and I don't want it stopped. Uh, we've got to remember AI, medical AI, is already making people's lives better. That is nothing but an unqualified good. What we've got to do is be adult. Oh, my God, John, we're back to that bloody Alistair Crowley again. And the crowned and conquering child, please tell me he was wrong. I know he's wrong. Um, just a swine on the make, but he worries me. Back to you, John. Well, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a lot to think of. And... Uh... I think if we keep in mind the way in which we should try and compartmentalize ourselves somewhat between the sacred and the profane, and you know, in, in attempting to to do uh, what we're doing here, I I try to point towards that which is is to be treated reverently, and there's there is a, a, a place for humor always, you know. In fact, uh, humor is key. The, the 
most common description of Rudolf Steiner was he was always telling jokes. But if you go back to uh, Virgil's Aeneid, it was the Cuman Sibyl, who was a central Sibyl to the Romans. Uh, and she was in near the Greek city of Naples. And, and Virgil's Aeneas, uh, he's a character we know from Homer, right? Before his descent to the lower world, this is in uh, book six, that the, the statement is made, uh, procol este profani, procol o procol este profani, far o far away profane. And that is what he's informed is that there's anybody who's not initiated should like clear the area. That, that there is a difference between the sacred and the profane. And that, and Rudolf Steiner's adamant about that point is that you have to be able to uh, approach the sacred in a sacred manner uh, to, to gain a wholesome relationship to it. And the challenge, you know, like uh, one of my mentors, he used to sell peanuts outside of uh, Tiger Stadium. Uh, and he was an elderly theosophist who had been meditating daily for about 50, 60 years. And he said, well, there's this temple and around the temple, there's a courtyard. And then outside the wall of the courtyard, there's the barnyard. He says, that's where we are. <laughs> And so it's good to keep it in mind that, that you have to be able to have a sacred space. It's a good idea to set apart a time of the day to where you bring yourself into contemplation of higher things. Uh, and, that, and a good way to do it is, of course, like I've repeatedly stated, the uh, Lord's Prayer is the ideal vehicle to be able to approach the divine. because it, it uh, as Rudolf Steiner describes it, he says that it has it. It's, the, of course, the only prayer that Jesus Christ gave, and that in that prayer is encoded the principle of thy, if it be thy will. It's, it's a calling to the Father that you understand that if it's in the will of the Father, you're praying. And that kind of solves a scenario of two football teams both uh, praying for, to win the football game. This is not, that's not really prayer in the same sense, because true prayer doesn't have uh, an agenda, so to speak. It, it has, uh, it it's a, becomes a process of integration. And what is it you're integrating with? Well, the intentions of the divine spiritual beings. So that you align your thinking with the angels, the realm of feeling with the archangels, and your will with the Father. And so you have that whole idea of wisdom, love, leading to activity, that that's, that's that's the crux of the matter. But you have to be able to kind of uh, take and dispense with what Rudolf Steiner described as your sheath nature. And uh, many episodes ago, I gave a formulation that he gave about imagining Moses is before you and that you, you take and burn the golden calf to ashes and then put it in pure water and drink it. And that's that whole idea. And, and Rudolf Steiner had indicated that had not Moses done that, that Christ could not have incarnated on earth. So that's a real, a real riddle there because what are we talking about? Well, the worshiping of the golden calf the worshiping of the sheath nature, that, that uh, AI, 
is the ultimate play out of that whole drama is that that whole external aramonic uh, material realm and giving that realm permission to make decisions regarding you see that's that's you know, subnature techniques taking over the world I, you know is that a good idea well i i really don't think so because there's 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 no moral impulses written into that formulation. The moral uh, impulses have to come from the divine spiritual world. And the way in which it's meant to be is, is to come from human beings in perfect freedom. And Rudolf Steiner had indicated that the, the beings of the higher spiritual world, the divine spiritual beings, are looking toward learning the principle of love from the actions of mankind. That to be able to have the experience of the actual acting out of love with wisdom. And that the, the divine trinity that, in, that exists in the human being, that's that love, wisdom leading to action. That that's the the uh, principle, the, the love is, is in the logos, the wisdom is the manas, and the action is that force which moves the blood. That's the atman. So it, it's all integral towards uh, the meditative understanding. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, the AI people, not all of them, some of them are actually being reasonably obtuse, deliberately obtuse or sinister. Um, it's not that they're necessarily denying a super, super sensible. It's their abject refusal to even <laughs> to even examine the concept and the phenomena that, that go up to making that as a subject area. Um, there are there are phenomena, there are happenings, there are events, there are processes, there are things that happen that uh, people refer to by that language. I mean, it's their abject blind eye that's the extraordinary thing. And, the you know, as I say, they're, they're just total unwillingness to examine that as an argument or a series of possibilities or realities that impinge upon human life. Uh, because the minute that is entered upon the minute that is uh, allowed then the whole quest for ai doesn't fall apart but it takes a very different nature and as i say <clears throat> excuse me i'm not against uh, the sciences or the technologies i just wish they would become more human as rabelais said one of my great heroes you know science without conscience is the ruin of the soul and, and we haven't progressed beyond that francois rabelais a very very great man um, I think Big Al said he was one of his reincarnations. But let's face it, Big Al, you know, anyone that did anything had to be one of your previous incarnations. Therefore, you know, let's let's revere Francois Rabelais in his own right without that particular strain or stress being added to it. Um, Michael Palin was the python I was thinking of. He reinvented himself as this globe trotter of wisdom going along and finding wonderful spectacular locations with a bbc film crew and then writing books about it that became bestsellers i hate him i hate him yeah um what what a good th that's a good interval i mean they all reinvented themselves apart from john cleese poor old john cleese but moving on um yeah I, for me i mean the, the I mean, people have to remember um, I think I've made this confession on this show before. I mean, how how Anglo-Saxon actually am I? I mean, the name is Welsh. Uh, you know, in, in, if I was in Wales, they'd address me as Dybach. You know, David William, all Dybach, which has happened to me, unfortunately, on, on occasion. Um, I have a couple of phrases of Welsh. Don't push it. It doesn't go beyond that. Um, and, you know, if you go back far enough, Nearly all of my family lines are actually Irish. Um, so even the wonderful thing about being in Britain is, you know, how how British 
are the Britons and how British are the Anglo-Saxons. Um, therefore, I tend to have, I suppose, at least a foot in the Celtic way of viewing things. Um, for me, I suppose the W.B. Yeats's of the world, that beloved darling of Shakespeare and Company in Paris. Yes, I promised I'd get you into this episode. What about that for some fleet footwork? Ah. Um, you know, W.B. Yeats summed it up to a certain extent. You know, the Garden of the Gods can't be accidentally entered into. You must be invited. Um, the sacred by nature is never profaned. If you profane something that you think is sacred, it wasn't sacred. You hadn't really encountered the sacred. Um, I have that old, God, it's going back to that bloody Roman program again, Britons. Um, the gods don't often turn up in this in this series, but they're mentioned a lot. My favourite bit is where the, the vile general, whatever his name is, with his hordes, comes to these lands and he's determined to take over for all sorts of nefarious reasons. And he actually sees a, a, a carving or a, a working of one of the old one of the old gods um, in stone, and he's just staring at it. I thought that was a wonderfully dramatized encounter, actually by accident, of the whole Roman attitude to the sacred. They're staring it in the face, and they still don't know what they're dealing with. Um, and he's staring at this statue, and it's eyeballing him back, and he can't make head to tail of it. I, I think if anyone really encounters the sacred, they are swept away. We're only human, human, all too human, my dear Nietzsche. Um, and, you know, the mysterium tremendum doesn't really allow us beyond a certain point. And if we get beyond that certain point, along with Rudolf Otto, then we're really on our knees because that's what it's like. Excuse me. That's what it's like for a human being to actually encounter the gods, the angels, the sacred, and so on, let alone something above that. I mean, it, back to my endless Hegelianisms, you know, if you're looking at the absolute, the philosophical absolute, uh, what on earth could a human being ever say about such things? Nothing. Uh, therefore, Hegel, my lovely Hegel, is again one of the cleverest people in history because he admits it. Um, takes a whole book to write about it, but admits it. Um, yeah, I mean... <sighs> I think, I suppose, I, I need to make a confession. I mean, I, yeah, I was recently embroiled in the Wittgenstein Society, as you know, John, which is not an accident, if, if I'm completely honest. Um, I mean, I used to know DZ Phillips. Um, uh, people misunderstand DZ Phillips. I heard him speak at the University of London uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, people forgot, of course, he was a Congregationalist minister as well as this high-flown professor of, uh, of Wittgensteinian studies and linguistics and enchanting everybody as he spoke, and I think that was noticed. And there was a dumb, dumb-ass question at the end from the Anglo-Saxon. How about that for ethnically biased? Uh, the guy said, oh, and it wasn't true, by the way, because all of the arguments worked in their own right. Oh, all of this works. If, uh, all of this only works if there's a God to which DZ turned around and said in that wonderful Welsh way, I've never said there wasn't a God. So you have this wonderful confrontation between two types of consciousness in these aisles. Um, and of course, I also encountered, I won't say new, uh, Norman Malcolm um, when I was at King's College. I mean, uh, he was bloody old at that stage. The best friend of Wittgenstein had studied with him, had worked with him. Um, what a ferocious man. Have I said this to everyone before? I can't remember. What a ferocious man. I mean, I, you're bound to be intimidated if you're t talking to someone in the direct line of transmission of something. And he, oh, what a swine. He used to set reading uh, about, you know, a week before what he wanted read. And it was under pain of death that you've read it before you entered that bloody classroom. You know, and he bloody quiz people. What did it mean in this line? And if you didn't get the answer right, get out! Get out! You know, apart from the fact no lecturer would have the guts to do that nowadays, it showed he knew his stuff. So apart from the fact we were all terrified 
to actually say anything to him. It was it was fascinating. So I do have those links. And what? Re, why did I bring that up? Because the DZ Phillips had the sort of charmingly Celtic. We're we're looking at a mystery at the end of the day, and by definition, it's mystery with a capital M. No, we can't really go beyond language games. What would there be beyond that that a human being can actually describe, can actually enunciate? What a very zen, what a very astute, what a very clever perspective that's got all the romance with a capital R. That's got all the beauty. That's got all the goodness of a Celtic response to the environment. Whereas you get the sort of the Anglo-Saxon inspired uh, Norman, Wel Norman Malcolm convinced it's about arguments and counter arguments. And uh, again, there's no there's nothing wrong with that. And that is another valid way of approaching these things. But the, the, the contrast over the years between encountering those two struck me as stark and very, very revealing as different aspects of awareness, conscious awareness within these aisles. Don't know what you think about that, John, but I need to have a sip of water. Well, I mean, it brings to mind uh, our conversations about Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein and his two volumes of philosophy that basically contradict each other. And he exhausted his analysis of, of the philosophical approach and ended up uh, turning to Christianity. And so what does that tell you? And uh, <laughs> that in likewise uh, Hegel considered the Bible to be the unending source of inspiration. And the and Hegelian dialectic, which gets thrown around so much, that polarity of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which actually originates with Fichte. But uh, that's a whole other story. And uh, yeah, I just saw a notice from Amsterdam from Paula. She's saying that, that uh, Leo Zagami has resurfaced. And so uh, be on the lookout for our dear brother Leo, uh, and uh, where was it? Uh, he did a show with Paul Cottrell yesterday talking about the events of yesterday, 9-11. Yeah, you know, where they, they tell you that a guy in a cave uh, organized uh, something so unbelievably spectacular. That's a, that's a good yarn, if I ever heard one. But... Uh, Kind of hard to do from a, a cave halfway around the world. <laughs> Anyways, we know where that that dog won't hunt, as they say. But uh, so, getting back to your 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 uh, attempt to get close to some of these things, you, Rudolf Steiner said that that if you begin to to uh, talk in terms of spiritual world and the divine spiritual beings that people like that, you'll just make them angry. Uh, which is an interesting point. But if you look at elsewhere and piece together what he says, and I've said this on, on numerous occasions because we have to keep in mind that the analytical mind, it, it feeds on fear. And that basically the, the, the mental structures that are created through the analytical mind are attempts at resolving the unknown. You could call them a, a search for truth, but it doesn't mean necessarily that the, the, the mechanism by which they're attempting to achieve it is capable of getting them there. Because unless you include the supersensible, you're really not uh, playing with a full deck. You know, and again, it goes back to uh, the uh, wonderful, uh, let's see if I have it here. I thought I did. No, I don't have it here. Okay. Well, in any event, seeing an individual human being as, 
as being just kind of uh, quasi sophisticated animal is is the basic crux of the materialistic worldview, and it has no provision for the idea of the soul, let alone the spirit. And if we go back to uh, the writings of St. Paul, he, he very, very clearly points out the, the, the reality of the threefold nature of a human being, which we continually make reference to, because that's the basis of all understanding of, of Christian mysticism or any mysticism that, for that matter, that is uh, within the traditions that we tend to uh, approach it. And so in looking at this with, with, with more detail, uh, one begins to, to find a place within yourself that can give you a context. And that's what you're trying to find is a context by which to have a wholesome relationship. Because if not, you just can lose yourself in the world. You lose yourself in the insanity of the life of the senses. Because it's not there. That's the world of Maya. And, and going back to the very beginning, Rudolf Steiner said that the universe consists of consciousness. Well, what does that mean? I mean, think about that. Think, think about that all day. And, and what could that possibly mean? Because when you get into uh, his descriptions of the evolution of Earth evolution, where we're the fourth stage in the development, and that there's three preceding stages, old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, in many places he refers to those as stages of consciousness, right? So you have, uh, you have trance, his old Saturn, and deep dreamless sleep, old Sun, and then dream sleep, old Moon. Right, and then you have waking consciousness, the fourth stage where we are right now. Although it's kind of debatable if we're if we're really living in a waking consciousness the way it is today, it's like they're doing everything in their power to put a lull us back to sleep. But uh, struggle nonetheless. The greater the struggle, the greater the reward, and and it's not without a certain pain because. Uh, Beauty is the, the, the fruit of wisdom, and wisdom is the fruit of suffering. Okay, so when, you, when you're looking at Plotinus and his, his pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful, well, only our Father in heaven is good, so that takes care of that one, right? And the true, well, that would be manas, and the beautiful would be the deed of Christ, that that's the ultimate beauty. But it's in a chiaroscuro, shall we say, it's in a polarity with that whole idea of that which is ugliness, that he took upon himself the ugliness of the world as a mantle in an attempt to try and, and redirect mankind's evolution towards the intentions of divine spiritual beings. Um, oh, you've just said something huge i don't know where to begin with that apart from the fact if the producers of britannia ever watch this show yes i'm still interested in becoming a druid even if it's a background part i know if i speak over nine words it costs more money i'll keep my mouth shut please just paint me green and let my eyes dilate i'd be great in a background scene um oh ooh. yeah i mean the fact lots of people won't consider consciousness a given but it must be derivative of something. That's interesting. I mean, sort of fundamentals don't have to justify their fundamentals. Uh, what we choose to justify is what we choose in many ways to either make a fundamental or not, because you know there are things called rules of judgment philosophically, which govern the sciences themselves. Um, how we create rules of judgment and what they mean and how we apply them are actually philosophical issues. Um, and that's to do with the, the science of knowledge, the philosophy of knowledge, epistemology, how we know what we know, uh, without which the sciences themselves couldn't really take place. Um, gosh, you said all sorts of things. Um, I don't agree 100% that the two books by Wittgenstein contradict. 
basically, the philosophical investigations is meant to stand on its own ground, and he's basically saying the first book is wrong. Um, I don't know how how people deal with that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, um, he certainly thought was the last word you had in a traditional, whatever that means, view of linguistics, psycholinguistics, and so on. Um, I have all sorts of problems with with the framing of those questions. And, and, and But then again, I, I always took my, my lead from philosophical investigations, <clears throat> which, of course, arose years later when he realized there were certain things he hadn't said in the Tractatus um, and arose out of a great deal of experience, life experience. Excuse me. I mean, he's an extraordinary man in all sorts of ways. <clears throat> you know, he was known at one point for going around Oxbridge um, saying, can you imagine what it means for someone to say, each day I become less and Christ becomes more? You know, I bet he wasn't invited to high table with those questions, but that's what he was telling all his students, and they were all looking horrified. But, you know, that's what he was saying. That, that's a wonderful, incredible thing from the, one of the most significant philosophers in Western history. Or, you know, the fact, I mean, a Zen statement. You know, the, the, <clears throat> the, fact, that world, the fact that the world exists is a mystery, not it pointing to a mystery. Oh, my God, you're back on Zen territory there. <clears throat> you know, you're making questions that get in the way of the actual mystery. So I find him and his approach intoxicating, particularly in the philosophical investigations. And I've got to write a defense of DZ Phillips. <clears throat> He's on the ropes over here at the minute because, you know, the minute somebody dies, the daggers come out and they're all stabbing him in the back at the minute. Yeah, what do you know, matey, with your professorship? Ha! Take that, University of Cardiff. You know, so all that's going on at the minute. Um, he passed on a few years ago, admittedly, but the daggers are still out. Um, so I've got to sort of say, it, hands off, leave DZ Phillips alone because. Um, because, again, what it strikes me as all leading towards is some sort of <clears throat> existential point, you know, the point that you can't discuss these things beyond a certain point because it becomes ludicrous in itself. Even if you could describe these things, you're describing them in such a way that makes no sense to human experience. Therefore, it's meaningless. Uh, Wittgenstein does not agree, <clears throat> excuse me, with the existentialists that life was meaningless. By the way, did they actually say that? Um, I can't think really of an existentialist that wants to come out and say the whole thing is meaningless. Not in that way. I mean, certainly if we look at Nausea by Jean-Paul Sartre, um, actually it's the abundance of the world that gets on the wick of Roquetin. It's not the fact it's meaningless. It's, it's the fact there's too much of it. Um, and even if you look at Camus, I mean, you know, with his jolly paganism, you know, the solution to everything, ca paganism with a small p, lowercase p, where, you know, everybody's on a beach and everybody's playing beach ball and they're going for a swim in the glories of, of Capri or somewhere like that. I don't know. You know, and, and what's wrong with that? So is he really, yeah, the world is absurd, but what he seems to mean is looking Looking for answers beyond a certain point is absurd. You know, I mean, we mustn't forget he was goalie in a football team. I bet he didn't find that absurd. And I bet if he let the ball in and was chided by his mates, that wasn't absurd and just brushed off. And, and you know, and certainly he didn't take writing in an absurd way. I mean, he was moaning about it all the time and arguing with either J, JP himself or or the French Communist Party, about what he could say and what he couldn't say. Well, I'm sorry, monsieur. You know, so all that's going on. Um, and even Ionesco, I love Ionesco. I, you know, Ionesco is one of my huge Romanian, big, cuddly, huggy bears. Um, a theatre of the absurd. Is it that absurd? I mean, I love the bald soprano. It's hardly ever performed here, probably because he's having a go at the English. Um where, you know, the, the whole absurdity of what is going on 
is with a guy reading an English newspaper and having an English breakfast, English muffins. By the way, that's not an English breakfast, matey. But, you know, the absurdity of everything being English. And I remember people forget the backdrop, the backstory of these things. You know, when The Bull Soprano was released, first released, and it was in Paris, and, you know, there were stony, stony, quiet, cold audiences who were just staring at each other. So he decided, because he was a theatre guy at heart, right, sod them, let's take it round the provinces and see what happens. And it was the same thing. It was the same deal. I can't remember. Was it... Um, Marseille, he got to one of the one of the small theatres in the provinces and somebody burst out laughing at the back. And then other people started laughing, which is actually what he was trying to do. You know, sometimes the catharsis is in the humour. It's not despite the humour. It's in the humour. And then you have the entire literary elite from Paris zooming down there as quickly as possible. My God, a work of genius. How could we not have noticed you know, so that, which of course he also thought was absurd, um, and you know his famous argument with Jean Paul Sartre. Neither of them took that particularly as meaningless. Um, oh, it's my favourite thing. It's on YouTube. If anybody ever gets the chance to see it, I'll, I'll give links to anyone who wants to see it. You've got the sweet young French reporter. Oh no, no, Mr. Inesco. You know your very public argument with Jean Paul Sartre, and he says Sartre, Sartre. What is it? He likes the Germans until they lose the war. No, no, he tells us. No, he tells us this, that, and the other. It's a slap after slap after slap. It's hilarious. Um, you know, let's not throw away the bathwater, and let's make sure we know what the bathwater and the bath actually are. And maybe let's have a bit of good old-fashioned humility, the one moral quality missing in all modern moral discourse. To admit the work of the gods is the work of the gods, and we are not them. And we can admire it, and we can approach it, but the correct response is awe, uh, and not contradiction, and not a mouthful of facile arguments, which simply show we haven't understood a thing in the first place. Handing back, John. Yeah, I mean... Uh... The whole idea, you know, that that such a resounding figure as Wittgenstein ultimately culminates in the Christian path is very telling. He basically went through the philosophical meanderings of all the streams that he had encountered because, mind you, he wasn't your typical uh, dyed-in-the-wool professional uh, career path philosopher. He was from uh, one of the wealthiest families in Vienna. And so he just decided to turn his attention to philosophy after he, he was one of the students of Bertrand Russell. And he, just, he decided to do a, a thorough investigation of that. And he was had a background in, in engineering. and And so uh, he was qualified mathematically, and, and all of that it was the math, the mathematics actually that brought him into the orbit of Bertrand Russell, and so he decided to take a look at this philosophy thing, and he deconstructed it according to linguistics, and then set it over here, and proclaimed his his uh, path of Christian renewal. I mean, that's, that speaks volumes. And, and you know, if you look at, uh, let's look at the poet, uh, Rana Maria Rilke, in his Duino elegies. In the first elegy, he says, who, if I cried out, would hear me among the angels' hierarchies? And even if one of them pressed me suddenly against his heart, I would be consumed in that overwhelming existence. For beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror, which we are just, still just able to endure. And we are so odd because it serenely disdains to annihilate us. Every angel is terrifying. And it's like, you know, it's hard to speak after something as compelling as that. And so there's, 
there's Rana Maria Wilka, Rilke in the the uh, Duino, you know, that he was he would be under the sponsorship of of nobility, and they let him go off to their castle. In this instance, a uh, castle on the, the Adriatic Sea, a beautiful place, and go there. And he wrote uh, Sonus Torfius and uh, the Duino elegies, but he it gave him sufficient silence to be able to focus himself. So we mustn't think that we can readily uh, find access to, to levels of profundity like that just in our daily affairs, uh, watching uh, sporting events or whatever, however we occupy our time. So that the, there's that whole, again, being able to, to, to invoke a, a sense of the sacred and but to be able to bring that so in, in a way in which it can start to uh, flow into, into your ordinary life. And that's essentially what the, the Lord's Prayer is capable of doing as a spiritual leaven to help us unfold. And that it's all encoded within that prayer, our whole path of, of evolution in relationship to Christ. Well, speaking of that, before we run out of time here, uh, Reverend David William Perry is the author of The Grammar of Witchcraft, which is a Shakespearean study. It's not a grimoire. And his evocative Shakespearean as poetry, Caliban's Redemption, and his major quasi-philosophical ruminations, Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts, edited by that very talented Daniela Urendust. And these are all available on Amazon, and I highly recommend them. And as to myself, I'm the author of The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science, of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Russ Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order, and with text and diagrams, uh, were forwarded by Douglas Gabriel of American Intelligence Media. And this is some 640 pages with a great many diagrams, and all the diagrams are reproduced in my second volume with a great many more additional uh, grail diagrams as I call them. And you can see how you can expand your cosmology to be able to contemplate the things that we uh, discuss on our show here. And uh, these books are available directly from me on eBay here in the States. Uh, if you're outside the US, you can contact me directly through the Academia webpage. That's, that there's a link below on, on uh, YouTube and on eBay. So you can get there, or you could private message me on Facebook. But uh, I have numerous people around the globe that have ordered my book overseas. And so, uh, and if you want to buy us, a cup of coffee. There's uh, you can buy a cup of coffee for Reverend David at paypal.me forward slash d perry seven seven seven, and for me it's paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell eight eight eight. And so, that being said, uh, we can continue on in our exploration here before David uh, leads us into another prayer. Right, I'm in trouble with the mic. I hope that means I'm. <clears throat> I hope that means people can hear me again. Um, <clears throat> just two things uh, before we get to prayer. Excuse me, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, John, you summed it up brilliantly. You know, the good is to do with God, therefore unapproachable, all wonderful, or all, all mysterious, or miraculous, uh, which leads us to the true and the beautiful. The true, of course, the sciences which we've touched on today, the, philo the philosophies that underpin what they're doing and why they're doing it. 
Um, but for me, <clears throat> I think you're right. Quasi philosophical might actually be <clears throat> a good description. Although actually, I was trying to write that as a poet. Um, the beautiful always struck me as the undiscovered path or the path rarely trodden on that type of intellectual level. Artists normally being so creative, they're either inventing new new vocabularies like William Blake. So nobody knows what they're talking about. Or they're, they're trying to shy clear of the sciences and the philosophies because they're doing something different and they don't want people to misunderstand what they're doing and then people misunderstand what they're doing. And the whole thing descends into mutual incomprehension. So for me, the path of the beautiful poetry, theatre, uh, uh, painting was always the alluring, mysterious path that curiously in modern times isn't being trodden in the way I think it should because it lapses into fantasy as opposed to the imaginative process, which is something quite separate. <clears throat> which leads me into my last thought of this week. I mean, we're human beings. Um, some people see that as a curse. Others see that as a blessing. There's never a blessing without a curse. There's never a curse without a blessing. You know, and it depends really on our point of view and what we think we are as human beings. If we're just bags of chemistry, then all these lockdowns and all these fake problems really don't matter too much because the bigger and stronger animal is taking charge. But maybe, just maybe, we're not simply bag of chemicals. And we're children of creation and we're children of the most high. And our thoughts are valuable and our consciousness comes from a hunger source. And we are loved and treasured and embraced for what we actually are, even in our darkest moments. Luther, for me, is the guy that summed it all up. It's We, we don't save ourselves by our works. How could we? but our neighbours need our works. What does Christ want? He wants our faith. My friends, have faith in your hearts and your minds and the call of the Almighty. This day and every day until we meet again next week. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. And if you would... Uh... Click like on our video on YouTube, that's helpful. And subscribe to my channel so you can get uh, in on the conversation. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be here with my dear friend, Reverend David, and, and I, I wish bon voyage to, to Leo and his Zagami and his latest adventures. And everybody there, you take care.